Hello, everyone. I hope all of you are doing great and staying safe. On behalf of Biopetro Arab Oil and Gas Academy and SPE Egypt section, I would like to welcome you to our third interesting webinar about introduction to well stimulation. This course consists of four webinars, four quizzes, and the final exam. First, let me introduce myself. My name is Selma Rashidi. I'm a petroleum engineer. I own my bachelor's degree from the American University of Ras al Khaima, and I'll be the moderator for today's session. Our lecture today will be delivered by Dr. Ahmed El Garhi. I don't need to talk much about him because he is well known for his steadfast diligence to knowledge and learning process. But for the new people, Dr. Ahmed is the director of the Pi Petro nonprofit educational project. He's an assistant professor at Marietta College USA, where he teaches hydraulic fracturing, geomechanics, and unconventional reservoir evaluation and development. Dr. Ahmed holds a PhD and master's both in petroleum engineering from Texas Tech University. In addition, he holds a master's degree in petroleum engineering, a postgraduate diploma in natural gas engineering, and a bachelor's degree in mining engineering from Cairo University in Egypt. Dr. Garhi has over 11 years of oil and gas industry experience with operation and service companies and focuses on hydraulic fracturing, geomechanics, and unconventional reservoirs, evaluation, and development. Before joining Marietta College, Dr. Garhi worked for Advantic uh, International, OGS, Khalda Petroleum Company, Texas Tech University, and Selman and Associates. Dr. Elgarhi published many journals in, and research papers with Elsevier, SPE, SPWLA, and ARMA. Also, he filled two U.S. patent applications to increase hydrocarbon recovery in both conventional and unconventional reservoirs. So we'll have an informative session by a knowledgeable person. If you have any question related to the technical content of the presentation, please drop it down in the Q&A session. Uh, section and Dr. Ahmed will be answering it after the session. Dr. Ahmed, we are so honored to have you and the mic is yours. Uh, Salma, thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, uh, as you know, today is the third lecture and today I will uh, try to introduce you to uh, uh, hydraulic fracturing design. How we do the design and how we do the evaluation after we do uh, the job itself. Uh, one of the main challenges for me in this uh, short course is that I used to uh, teach hydraulic fracturing in at least uh, 10 lectures, so 10 to 12 lectures. And uh, right now I need to finish everything in two lectures because we, uh, we, uh, you know, uh, we spend the first lecture talking about formation damage and the last lecture, which is uh, next week, will be talking about acidizing and acid fracturing. So, it, you know, it is a big challenge to... Uh, uh, summarize a lot of things about hydraulic fracturing in just two uh, lectures. So uh, please keep this in your mind that uh, what I'm doing uh, in the short course is introducing you to a big uh, topic or a big you know subject, which is hydraulic fracturing or also uh, acidizing and acid fracturing. And you need to learn a lot more after uh, this short course. Okay. Uh, quickly, before we start, you know, um, uh, this is what we have, what, what we are offering you this, uh, uh, you know, this month. Uh, we have two courses, one by Dr. Hamid Sorosh. And again, I'm encouraging all of you to learn about uh, geomechanics. Geomechanics is one of the most amazing, uh, you know, uh, fields in oil and gas. And uh, my class and the third class by uh, uh, Johannes. It will be, uh, it is already delayed to the next month. So if you are interested to learn about uh, Python and how to use uh, programming in oil and gas, please register in uh, Johannes class. Uh, it will be in February. Also in February, we have February and March, we'll have a, a big training in natural gas engineering. Please try to, uh, if you are interested to learn about natural gas engineering uh, topics, uh, please uh, register as soon as possible. To uh, get a certificate in this class, you need to uh, uh, submit um, uh, quizzes and get uh, overall grade of 70% uh, or more. Also, you need to do the final exam and you get 70 degree or 70% uh, uh, or more, okay? 
Uh, one more thing, we uh, PyOpeto is mainly uh, delivering, uh, you know, services for students and all service for students is free of charge. So I get many questions about that. PyOpeto uh, services for students, it was free of charge and will stay forever free of charge. So please, you know, don't, don't think about it. Uh, what is confusing you is PyOpeto started to give some services for companies and this is paid services. This is only for companies, not for students. Services for students is uh, are free of charge. Okay. So let's begin our lecture today. So today I will try to introduce you to what is a frag design, what is the software we are using and what is the software uh, do for us. Also, I will uh, talk to you about something called mini frag test, something very common to do before any frag job. Mainly we are talking about conventional uh, jobs, like when we frag sandstone formation, for example, because when we talk about uh, shale formation, it is a different story. But you know, the good news, I, I'm, I wouldn't want to say it is a good news or bad news, but uh, you know, shale is very common, shale development very common in the United States, in China, in Argentina, but you know, still in the Middle East or in, you know, in Kazakhstan or Russia, this is not, is still not common, okay? Uh, also, I will show you how to, uh, you know, we do the analysis for the mini frag test. And at the end, I will show you a real case from somewhere in the globe. I'm not allowed to tell you, you know, more information about the location of the company or the well itself, but I will show you a real case uh, about uh, a hydraulic frag job and how we implement it. Okay, so let's begin. Okay, before we start, I know that I did not teach you anything yet. But please get ready to answer these questions. And don't feel shy if you did not understand what is that about. No problem. Try to answer these questions, four questions. Try to answer them very you know, quickly. Why I'm asking you to do this? Because at the end of this lecture, I will check again if you get all these questions right or wrong. I will explain all of them today, but I want to know, you know, what is you already know. Okay, I will give you like um, uh, 10 more seconds. Okay, so I, I will stop the, uh, you know, I will end the poll right now. And the first question, I'm asking you about hydraulic fraction. Is it a failure? Is that a tension failure or a shear or compression or whatever? This is one of the very confusing questions to students. Okay, so try to think about this is this circle I'm doing by my you know fingers. Imagine this is a well bore, and you are looking to that well bore from the top, and this is the well bore. Okay. And we have a mud drilling fluid in, in the middle. I'm drilling right now. And I have a drilling fluid in the middle, okay? And this drilling fluid has very high weight. So it will keep pushing in that circle from inside until you get less circulation. You fracture your formation. The, in hydraulic fracturing, we are doing the same thing. This is your well bore, the circle, and then we have a lot of preparations. It is open to the, you know, to, to communicate the well bore with the formation. Then we have a drilling, a, a, a frac fluid in the middle, pushing against this wall, the circle, until it fails. It opens a hydraulic fracture. Look, when this open, this is tension failure. These two fingers, you are pulling, now you made a tension from the two sides, 
Okay, so hydraulic fracturing is a tension failure. It is not shear, it is not compression. It is only uh, a tension failure. I know that it is hard to imagine at the first time, but try to think about the circle and the force applied from the middle in the, you know, on the, all the sides until it fails. When it fails, it means it was tension. So this is the answer for the first uh, question. So let's continue. Okay, so keep in your mind, hydraulic fracturing is a tension failure and loss circulation is a tension failure, okay? So uh, frag design software, there's many, many softwares in the market, some of them very famous, some of them, you know, uh, others, uh, you know, less famous, but Frag Pro was very, very famous software to use in hydraulic frag design. Why I say, I'm saying was, because the company producing Frag Pro, which is Carboceramics, went to bankruptcy last year, and maybe Frag Pro, you will not see it in the market anymore. Okay, Fracade, this is a software by Schlumberger and this is a local software. So you cannot get a license, uh, you know, from Schlumberger to use this software because you use it internally. Okay, Gopher is a, a very uh, good software by Beret and Associates and uh, Halliburton bought Beret, uh, I believe last year. So Gopher now become part of Halliburton, okay. MFRAC is a very good is a very good software. FRACMAN is a, also a very good software. Here in the university, I, am, I, I used to use uh, FRAC Pro, and now I'm using uh, GoFood. Okay. Okay. So to design a FRAC job, the first question I want to ask you: What is the input to that software? The first input I will talk about, and I will try to summarize these inputs. The first important input is some general information about the well and the location and the reservoir you will frack and some general information about the owner of the company and just general information, okay? Then I need to have the mechanical earth model. I ask this company to get the logs and based on these logs, especially if I have sonic log, which is what, what we call quad combo, okay? I use these logs to uh, build a mechanical S model. Build a mechanical S model means for that well, I should know the mechanical properties of this formation. Mechanical properties like Young's modulus, Poisson's ratio, UCS, uh, minimum horizontal stress, and so on. Okay? And remember to convert dynamic Young's modulus to static Young's modulus. Try to find an ap appropriate uh, technique to um, uh, convert dynamic youngest models to static youngest models with minimum uncertainty. You cannot get it perfect without getting cores and do a, a triaxial test in the lab, which is not the, you know, uh, the case in, in, you know, in all the projects. Most of the cases we don't have uh, any cores, so we need to use um, uh, a sonic log plus using a correlation to convert dynamic to static, okay? And uh, another comment I want to tell you that if you are designing a frag job, I care much about the reservoirs section and maybe 500 feet above the reservoir and maybe two, 300 feet below the reservoir. And that's it. This is what's important to me uh, in the mechanical S model because this is what will influence the uh, mechanical, the, the fracture dimension. And for the overburden, most likely I will, I will get it right because I'm integrating the density log and most likely I will have uh, all the density log of that well. Okay, also I need some information about the frac fluid. What kind of frac fluid you would use? We have hundreds of different fluid, frac fluid types and each type has different specifications. So you need to decide what is the frac fluid you will use. Also, you need to decide what is the propane type and size you will use, okay? And you, you, you select the propane, for example, the size and, and, you know, and strength based on your understanding to the mechanical properties of the formation, okay? Also, you need to build a treatment schedule. What you will inject first, what you will inject second, what you will inject third until 
you complete your job. If you will do a bad design, you may get tap screen out. Tap screen out means you will fail to inject the whole treatment. If you are designing to uh, inject, let's say, 100,000 gallons of uh, frac fluids plus propane and this kind of things, and after you inject 10% of it, you fail to continue because the pressure went up very high and you cannot push any more frac fluids or propane into the formation. Why we get this situation? Because the design was very poor, okay? Okay, so uh, what should be the output? I summarized the inputs for you, but what should be the output? What is the most important output? The output, mainly I need to have a frag dimension. I need the software to tell me, hey, what is the fractal height? What is the fractal length? What is the fractal width? Look, look to the mouse. Here is the well bore. And this is the fractal height. This is the fractal height. And this is the width. Okay. And this is the fracture lens. What I want from you is to build your own engineering sense. When you see a number, when you read a number, this is the fracture height. You, you should know how to judge, does it make sense or not? For example, if I tell you the fracture lens, I did a, a job using, let's say, uh, 2,500 barrels. Okay, and the fracture length was 5,000 feet. This is crazy. No one will trust that. Okay, but if you tell me the fracture length was 500 feet, yes, yeah, this is possible. If you tell me it is 400 feet, this is possible. If you tell me the fracture width is uh, 12 inch, this is doesn't, you know, this again doesn't make any sense. The fracture width must be something very, very, very small, something like two millimeters or a, a small portion of a one inch, okay? So again, what is important to you to, is to, uh, to know how to judge these numbers, okay? Also, the software will tell me how to, uh, let's say, uh, give me an estimate for the fracture conductivity. So I can evaluate if it was a good job or not. Okay, treatment schedule. I know that you did not see any treatment schedule before. If you uh, still student, know nothing about hydraulic fracturing, so maybe you did not see any treatment schedule. So in the treatment schedule, you will see something called pad volume, something called main stages, something called propane concentration, something called uh, flush stage, uh, some, something we call clean volume, something we call dirty volume, and maybe you are not lucky and you get tip screen out. So let me explain each one, you know, uh, and in the next slide, I will show you a real uh, treatment uh, schedule. Okay, so the pad volume, this is a frac fluid we inject at the beginning without any propent, just to open to initiate the fracture. To initiate the fracture, let the fracture take some dimension. So whenever you start injecting propent, the fracture will not get uh, plugged immediately and you get a tape screen out and you fail to continue the job. So the pad is something very important to complete, to let you complete the job to the end. But the question is, what is the optimum volume of the pad? I don't want it to be very big. I don't want to be to make it very small. Just I want to make it exactly the volume will let me complete the job to the end. Okay? So this is the main function of a pad. The main stages, I cannot inject propane in a high concentration from the beginning. Let's say I cannot inject propane in a concentration of 5 ppg, 5 pounds per gallon. If you start with 5 ppg, your fracture will get plugged immediately and you cannot continue the job. So you should start by half ppg for a few minutes, then one ppg for a few minutes, then two ppg for a few minutes. And if you get any 
you know, indication that the pressure is going up and you will get a tip screen out, you can keep the, the propane concentration as it is and you will not, you cannot, uh, it is not right to uh, increase it. And maybe it will be better to start flushing. Okay, and I will tell you why we need to start flushing. Because if you if you fail to flush all this propane from the tubing, you need to clean it later, and it, this will cost you a lot of money. Okay, and if you get uh, this tip screen out, let's say in the first uh, fifty percent of the job, if the job is one hour, and before thirty minutes you get tip screen out, this is very bad design. This is poor design. Okay, but if you get tip screen out at the end, let's say in the last 20 minutes, it is not a big deal. Yes, it is a problem, but not a big problem. Whenever you see an indication that the pressure is going up, ramping up, and you will get tip screen out, immediately try to uh, start uh, flushing. Stop injecting propane and try to flush with, uh, you know, linear gel or, you know, um, uh, slick water or just water. Okay. Clean volume, what is clean volume? Clean volume, this is the fluid, the frac fluid without any propent. We call it clean volume. When this, uh, you know, frac fluid mixed with propent, it, we, we will call it dirty volume. You know, it will look black. You know, frac fluid, which is like a jello, and it has some black stuff. I, I showed you uh, how propent look like before. So imagine this gray stuff, when it mix it with a gel, it will make something look, you know, dirty. This is why we call it dirty volume, okay? And tip screen out, this is the nightmare we want to avoid. Tip screen out means the propane goes to the tap, get high stress, build high stress zone. So whenever you inject, you cannot break and continue, uh, you know, you cannot move forward. So the surface pressure will keep increasing very high until the pumps will stop by itself for safety, okay? Okay, so here is uh, a real, uh, you know, uh, treatment schedule. And one of the funny comments I wanna share with you is that whenever you get this treatment schedule from any company, most of the cases you will see mistakes. You will see uh, typo mistakes. Okay, and I will, show you one, I will show you one typo here, okay? So in this table, here is clean gallons. So this is clean volume by gallons. And in the next column, clean gallons again, but the number is different. This is a mistake. If you divide the, this number by 42, you will get this number. It means the first column is gallon, and the second column is barrel, okay? And the third column, this is a fluid type. We have slick water. We have, um, you know, uh, something has X-link. X-link, this is cross-linked gel. So this is a type of cross-linked gel, and we have slick water again at the end. So we, have, we are using two different types of frac fluid. In a different um, jobs, you may see something different, okay? So most likely you will see linear gel at the beginning, linear gel at the end, and cross-linked gel in the middle, in the main stage. Linear gel in the pad stage, linear gel in the flush, and uh, cross-linked gel in the middle. But here, instead of using cross-linked, instead of using linear gel, they are using slick water. And slick water is just water mix it with water with KCL and mix it with friction reducer, okay? Then we have the rate. We have the rate. We start with 20 barrel per minute, then 35 and keep it constant. Please, one of you write this question down, why we are trying to keep the injection rate constant and ask me this question at the end. I will answer this question after a few minutes, but if you did not get the answer, try to ask me this question at the end to uh, you know, answer it again. And here is the propane concentration. At the, at the first stage, this is a pad stage, no propane at all, zero propane. Then we start with 0.5 uh, 
50g pound per gallon, then one, then one and a half, then two, three, four, and at six, they start to sweep and flush. This is your design. When you have a different well, you will have a different design, okay? And uh, here is a propane mass, here is a propane type, and here it's showing the change of the pressure, the surface pressure, the, the, you know, the surface pressure, the bottom hole pressure, the you know, propane concentration, and so on. Okay, I have a question for you. If you notice that you may get a screen out, what you should do? You may pump more pad volume to avoid tip screen out. You may, you may increase pump rate. You may use higher viscosity fluids. You may use smaller propant. You may use fluid loss additive. Fluid loss additive is something like you are playing with the viscosity. Okay, but all of these options I cannot do them on the fly. When you are running the job, only one option of these I can do on the fly. Can you help me? I know that there is no uh, you know, uh, good communication between us right now. You cannot uh, uh, show me what is the right answer, but let me answer it for you. You can only increase the pump rate. Only the second option, this is what is valid if you are running the job right now. If I did the design and I did a mistake in the design, so I'm, I'm getting a tip screen out. So the only thing I can try is try to increase or change the pump rate. When you change the pump rate, you may hammer in the formation, you get that uh, tip screen out, get, you know, again, you know, vanish, and you can continue growing the fracture. Maybe it will work, maybe not. If it will not work, go for sweep, for sweep and flush immediately. Otherwise, you will spend a lot of money to clean your well board. Okay? Look to the first one, pump more pad volume. It is too late. I'm already did a bad design for the pad volume. So maybe in the future treatment, I will do that. Use higher viscosity. It is too late. I maybe I will do that in the future well. Use smaller propane. It's too late. Use fluid loss additive. This is again too late. I can do that in the future job. But in the job I'm running right now, there is no option except you play with the injection rate because you can in, you know increase the injection rate and the formation will feel it immediately. Okay. So try to think about these options and what is valid to do in a, a job right now we are running, or maybe something we need to fix the design for future uh, hydraulic track jobs. Okay, tip screen out in the software, you will see something look very red like this. This means very high propane concentration, especially near the tip. The tip, this is the beginning of the fracture. We call it the tip. Okay, so near the tap, you will see a lot of red. And uh, this is only if we are showing the propane concentration inside the fracture. Okay, and this is uh, something very bad if we get it. Okay, now let's talk about many fractures. From its name, something many means something very small. And many fractures means I will do a very small frag job. But the question is, why we need to do that? Okay, so a many frag test is something we do before most of hydraulic frag jobs. So before any frag job for, a, let's say, sandstone formation, we prefer to do a many frag test, except we know exactly all the properties of that formation. So maybe we'll say, hey, I will save my money and I will not do it. But Personally, I'm not recommending you to do this. So whenever you do a frag job in a sandstone formation, try to do a mini frag test or a DFET, which is another test, or both of them before any uh, job to understand the formation properties, to confirm your design parameters, and so on. Okay? So as a definition, a mini frag test is an injection 
uh, injectivity test to diagnose the uh, formation, to know exactly what is the minimum horizontal stress, what is the breaking down pressure, what is the breakdown pressure, what is the closure pressure, what is, um, let's say, uh, the leak off. And leak off, this is describing the behavior of the frac fluid, how it leaks to the formation. When you inject something, when you inject fluid into the formation, because of the permeability, these fluids will keep, you know, uh, leaking deep inside the formation. And the leak off is different from a formation to another formation. Okay, so a manifract test will help me to understand the uh, leak off behavior. Also, will help me to know how to to, to help me to know the uh, closure pressure, the breakdown pressure. Also, I can do analysis to get the uh, initial reservoir pressure. Also, I can know how to get the uh, permeability. Okay. Okay. Uh, but when you do a mini frac test, which is something very small, maybe something like 100, only 100 barrel or, you know, a few thousand of gallons. So something very small uh, frac job. And whenever I do the analysis, it is divided into two groups of analysis, something we call pre-closure and something we call after closure. Okay, what does that mean? Look to this figure. I'm injecting pressure going up, look to the mouse, pressure going up, up, up to this point, then boom, fracture happened, fracture started here. This is the breakdown pressure. Now, you uh, broke the formation, okay? Now the hydraulic frag job, the injection is continuous. Why continuous? Because look here, here is the injection rate is still going on, okay? At this point, the injection stopped, okay? Go up here, we stop the uh, injection. You will see the pressure will start to fall off and we get this point, the ISIP, the instantaneous shutting pressure. <clears throat> and we did not get it exactly at the point we stopped the injection rate because we, the friction, the system will not feel that injection stop immediately. And we'll still get like a friction for, you know, you know, uh, you know a second, you know, a part of a second. So we get the point for the ISIP, something a little bit after the, uh, this we call the cash and pressure, the end of pumping, okay? And from this line to this line, this line, this point here, this is a closure pressure. This is a closure pressure. So I have a period of pressure, fall of pressure before the closure and another period after the closure. I will do a specific analysis for what is after, before the, the closure and what is after the closure. And from each group, I will get some uh, parameters and I will show you what kind of parameters we can get, okay? And also I will show you how to get the closure pressure, okay? Okay. So uh, again, for the many frac test, it is, you know, uh, as I told you, it will give me a better understanding for my uh, formation. I will know the breakdown pressure, I will know the closure pressure, I will know the um, uh, permeability, I will know the uh, initial reservoir pressure and so on. Okay. So many frac test is better than something we call closed chamber test. And I know that this is uh, maybe out of uh, our lecture scope, but you know, very quickly closed chamber test this is a test we do during something we call drill stem testing. And drill stem testing is uh, some specific tools, some specific tests we do whenever we discover a new reservoir. Whenever you discover a new reservoir, let's say in the Western Desert in Egypt, and there is no previous wells drilled in that reservoir, I need to run a drill stem test to understand, to collect more information about the reservoir. Okay? so. Many frac tests <clears throat> can give you some information about the uh, reservoir, and it is way easier than that closed, or you know, also cheaper than the, uh, uh, compared with the closed chamber test. And if you wanna 
uh, no more information, I left you some uh, a good definition for that. And I will share the, the slides with you. I forgot to post it, but I'm planning to share these slides with you, the PDF. Okay. Why we perform a manufact test? Whenever we do something, we need to ask ourselves why we are spending money to, uh, to do that. Okay, so manufact test can get me the permeability and the initial, initial uh, reservoir pressure. And why this is important? Why this is important? It will assist you to, uh, you know, uh, you know, assess the production, collecting, you know, production and uh, pressure data. Also, it will provide initial inputs for reservoir models. The reservoir engineers would like to get more information about the reservoir to, uh, you know, uh, update or to feed the reservoir simulators. Also, it will help you to, um, you know, better quantify the reserves and, you know, and, you know, um, uh, enhance the stimulation efficiency in the future. Also, um, what is direct, we get it directly from the manufacturing test is to know the fractional gradient. Whenever you break down the formation, I will get that pressure, and this is the breakdown pressure. Divide that pressure with depths, you will get the fractional gradient, okay? Also, I will get the closure pressure. Also, I will get the leak off coefficient, okay? This slide, very, very important. When someone asks you why we are doing many fact tests, you need to list all of these. Okay. So a bad thing about when we develop shale that we cannot run the many fact test as it is, but you know, we, we are not uh, focusing on, on uh, shale uh, in this course. We are mainly focusing on uh, conventional reservoirs, but you know, something logic you know that shale has very extremely low permeability, something by Nano Darcy. And if you want to stay, uh, if you want to watch that, you want to inject and you wait and you, you, you watch or you monitor the pressure drop, you may stay forever because the permeability is extremely low. Okay, so the many practice we are doing for uh, sandstone formation, uh, it is not convenient to run in shale formation. And the reason, because of the uh, extremely low permeability of the shale. Okay, now let's move to many frac analysis. Okay, we have two groups, something called PCA, pre-closure analysis, and something called after-closure analysis. What is after-closure? This is very similar to the well testing class you are getting in your school. This is PTA technique, pressure transient analysis. This is after closure. But what is pre-closure, we can run something called J function or something called square root of time technique. What is the value of this? The square root of time technique will let you know what is the closure pressure. The J function, the J function, the J function will help you to know what is the closure pressure plus understanding the leak off to identify the leak off, uh, you know, uh, coefficient or, you know, to understand the behavior of that leak off. And for the after closure, and I told you this is very similar to um, uh, the PTA class you are getting in your school, the pressure transit analysis. And in PTA, uh, mainly we get the initial reserve of pressure and permeability. Okay, so it will be very similar to that. Okay, so the parameters we need to get for the uh, pre-closure analysis, I can get the minimum, the, the, the closure pressure. And in some books, which is again very, you know, sometimes confusing, the closure pressure, you'll see closure pressure equal minimum horizontal stress. This is not very accurate, but what I can tell you the value of the closure pressure, very close to the minimum horizontal stress. So you can say, yes, this is semi-equal, but it is not exactly equal because, you know, there's a, a debate about it. And here is the instantaneous shutdown pressure. This is the final uh, bottom hole injection pressure minus the friction component. This is why we waited a little bit for a few seconds after 
we stop pumping because I want to be sure that the system already in a static mode, so there is no friction. Okay, and again, the fraction gradient is ISIP divided by formation depth. Maybe in another book or you know another equation, you will see something. The fraction gradient is minimum horizontal stress divided by formation depth or breakdown pressure divided. Again, this is uh, it will not give you a big difference. So, um, you know, I don't want to uh, get you uh, in this debate, especially because the difference is very, very small. Okay. Delta P, uh, the, the net pressure, the net fracture pressure, this is the ISIP minus the closure pressure. This is the pressure inside the fracture itself. And this pressure, which is maybe that delta P inside the fracture, which is maybe 50 PSI or 100 or 200 PSI, this is what will keep the fracture growing in length and width and height. Okay, so the net pressure, this is the pressure inside, inside the uh, fracture at any uh, second. Okay, the fluid efficiency, this is the ratio of the stored volume inside the fracture divided by the total volume we injected. So whenever you see any hydraulic frac job program, you will see something called fluid efficiency. Hey, what was the fluid efficiency? What was the frac fluid efficiency? Okay, mainly this is the fluid inside the fracture, stored inside the fracture, divided by the total volume I injected. So maybe it is 30%, 40%, something like that, okay? And here is an equation, um, uh, an equation to calculate it using the g function, which is, is, we still did not say anything about the g function uh, yet, but you know, this is the gc, and gc is the uh, g function at closure, okay? And divided by two plus gc. Okay, what is g function? Guys, if you, don't, if you are not a big fan of um, uh, calculus and you know, differential equation, maybe you will suffer uh, a lot understanding what is G function. But the good news is that the software will do these things for you, okay? So the J function, this is a dimensionless time function relating the shut in time, the shut in time, now I'm injecting at a specific point, I stopped, this is time zero, and I keep calculating the time until the end of, uh, until the closure, so this period of time, this is the shut in time. And shut in time is changing from zero, which is when it stopped injecting until the closure. This is the shut in time, okay? So it is a dimensionless time function relating shut in time T to total pumping time, TP. Total pumping time. So from starting from, you know, uh, when we start pumping to the end of uh, pumping, okay? At an assumed constant rate. Why I'm putting underline here? Why I'm making it bold? Remember the question I asked you a few minutes ago. Why when we inject hydraulic fracturing, why we wanna keep it in a constant rate as possible? Because the J function technique, for example, one of the, its mathematical model assumption is this is a constant rate. So if your injection is not in a constant rate, means all the values or all the conclusion you will get from the J function analysis will be wrong. Okay, so when you estimate the closure pressure, it will be wrong. When you estimate the, the leak off, it will be wrong. So to avoid that, please try to keep the injection rate constant as possible. Okay, and here we have like a two assumptions like when we, whenever alpha, this is not A, this is alpha. Alpha equal one. This is when we have a low leak off. Alpha equal half. Whenever we have high leak off, high leak off means whenever you inject, the fluid leaks immediately to the formation. Low leak off means when you inject in the fracture, the fracture like to balloon, and there is very little who, you know, fluids leaks into the formation, okay? And here is, some mathematical meaning, but again, this is not 
very important for you as a student, but try to uh, you know, uh, understand it as possible. And again, the software will do these calculations and will do this uh, plotting uh, for you. Okay, let's talk more about G function. Look, here is, here is the pressure. Here is the pressure, okay? And whenever you get the derivative, the first derivative of the pressure is to be this line. If you get the second derivative or GDP over um, uh, GDG over DP, this will be the J function. Okay, here is C, here is the pressure, here is dp over dg, which is the first derivative of the pressure, and here is the second derivative, which is g dp over dg. I want to ask you a question. Why we need to get the derivative? Why we are spending all that mental effort to get derivative, or sometimes we, we plot something in a log scale? Why? Because when the trend of injection, for example, change from linear flow to radial flow, for example, or from pre-closure to after-closure. So if you cannot see any change in the pressure, it means I cannot know when exactly this happened, when exactly I moved from a linear flow to radial flow. I don't know when exactly I moved from, let's say, uh, pre-closure to after-closure. So we need to try things, plot it in a log scale and see what will happen. Uh, try to get the derivative and see what will happen. Try to get the second derivative and, to, and see what will happen. If you do something and you see that the trend is making a clear difference, I can say, hey, here is a closure pressure because the trend changing. Hey, here is a point that the linear flow become a radial flow, for example. Okay, so this is why we try first derivative, sometimes we do uh, log scale, sometimes we do second derivative and so on. Okay, so let's go back. I will take a line, a red line from the origin here, touching the J function curve. And this point will be the closure pressure. Very easy. Okay, look here. I will make a line from the origin. Here's the J function, and here is the, the pressure. And we have two graphs, one for the pressure, two, two you know, plot. This is the, the pressure, two, you know, uh, three curves, sorry. One for the pressure, one for the first derivative of the pressure, one for the J function. Okay? See, at this point, if you go to look to check the pressure, Nothing clear. I cannot understand anything from the pressure here. I cannot see the closure pressure on the pressure curve. If you check this graph, dp over g, again, you cannot see anything clear. But it's obvious, very clear in the g function. Okay? And I will call that normal leak off. Count with me. So the first type is normal leak off. When you see a straight line, from the origin matching with the J function, the beginning of the J function, and the, the, the J function is also a straight line. So we call that a normal leak off. A normal leak off, here is the fracture. Look to the mouse, here is the fracture. And here is the leak off to the formation. This is normal leak off. Okay. A second type, so the first type was normal leak off. The second type, we call it fracture height recession or transverse fracture storage. It has two names. Fracture height recession maybe is you know easier. And instead of a straight line, you will see a hump, this bend downward, this hump downward, this concave shape downward, okay? And when the straight line from the origin touch this point, I will say this is the closure pressure. 
make sense. So if you see this graph, or, you know, this type of leak off, what you will name it? I will name it height recession. Okay, fracture height recession. Okay, look, fracture height recession, when the fracture invade impermeable zone at the top and impermeable zone at the bottom. So let's say the fracture is going out of the reservoir and start to invade the formation at the top, the border of the reservoir from the top and the, in the bottom. And that uh, upper and lower layers is impermeable. So, and you start already frack it. So when you stop pumping, this top part and bottom part will close way faster than the fracture itself inside the reservoir, okay? So we get the situation when we have impermeable zone at the top and impermeable zone at the bottom. I mean, at the top and bottom of the reservoir, okay? Look here. This part at the top, this is which is imper impermeable zone, will close first. And the, the fluid, the frac fluid will leak to the fracture and then the leak off will go, will, you know, will, will leak into the uh, reservoir itself. Okay, so we have two things. We have uh, the part of the fracture inside the impermeable zone at the top and at the bottom, and we have the part of the fracture inside the reservoir itself. And whenever we see this hump downward, we call that this is a fracture height recession. Okay, so this was the second type. And we, we, we can explain it more by saying, hey, hey, this is the early time, the early time whenever we have the fracture inside both zones, the reservoir and the top part and bottom part in the impermeable zone and the late, the late time whenever it, it is already inside the uh, reservoir only, and the, the top part and bottom part in that impermeable zones already closed. Okay, now see, only the fracture inside the reservoir. Okay, the third type is pressure dependent leak off, or PDM, pressure dependent leak off. And you see a hump, that bend or that curve, that hump upward, not downward. Now it is upward. And we see a straight line after that. Whenever you see the J function looks like this, you say, hey, this is pressure dependent leak off. It means there is a lot of fissures inside this reservoir. So we have two networks of fracturing. We have the real fracture, the hydraulic fracture itself, and we have fissures or little fra natural fractures inside the reservoir. And whenever you inject, these little fractures or little fissures will start to uh, inflate and open and take fluids. And whenever you stop pumping, these fissures will deflate or will close faster than the hydraulic fracture itself. So we have two types of fractures in that reservoir. We have the natural, the natural uh, fissures, or, you know, um, uh, fractures inside the reservoir, and we have the hydraulic fracture we created. And how to know that? We will see the J function looks this way. Is it clear? Easy? Okay. In the early time, the two fracture systems will be open, the hydraulic fracture itself and the micro, the, the, you know, the fissures will be also open. But in the late time, in the late time, all these fissures will close again back to normal and only what will be leaking is the hydraulic fracture itself. Okay. The last one, so we have four types. Okay, the last one is fracture tip extension. Whenever we have a very low permeable formation, maybe when we stop injecting, you stop injecting and you see the fracture, the fracture lens keep growing. Keep growing even after we stopped the injection. 
It means there is a stored energy inside the fracture. And even after we stop pumping, the fracture is still for you know, a short period of time is still growing, growing in limbs, not in height, not in width. It is only in limbs. So whenever we, we, uh, we, we have a J function looks this way, we have a hump, a big hump like this. And there is no straight line at the end. If this big one like this, I can say, hey, this is fracture tip extension. So we have four types and I can identify these four types only by plotting the J function. Good. Okay. So here is how it works. Look. And after I stop pumping, the fracture grow. Now the fracture was short. I stopped pumping. The fracture grow in limbs. Okay. So we call that, uh, you know, tip extension. Okay. Uh, very quickly, for after closure, I will not talk a lot about it. Uh, it is very similar to what we do in, in uh, pressure transient analysis, like the follow uh, test analysis and this kind of things. And now because of the running the J function and the square root of time uh, technique, you know exactly what is fracture closure. You know where is the fracture closure. And what is after the fracture closure, this is what I will apply ACA technique after closure analysis, okay? And in a part of it, you will see linear flow. In another part, you will see radial uh, flow, okay? Here is a linear flow, a linear flow. And when you go far away from the fracture, you will see a radial flow. So it is a linear flow plus a radial flow. And you need to know when was the linear and when was the radial uh, flow, okay? And there is many um, uh, techniques to analyze that. The most famous one is uh, two techniques, one by uh, Nolte, which is a very famous guy and he's uh, the writer, one of the most famous books in uh, reservoir stimulation. Uh, I believe he used to work for uh, Slumberger. And Solomon, Craig technique, Solomon, this is uh, Mohammed Solomon uh, technique. And you know, Mohammed Solomon was my PhD advisor and he is Egyptian or he's graduate from Cairo University. Okay. So the last thing, which is very interesting, I'm keeping the interesting part to the end. So I believe you will enjoy this part. This is a real example. Let's See, so whenever you do a frag job, the working scenario is different from a country like in Saudi, or Kuwait, or Egypt, from what we do here in the United States. What we do here in the United States, we have two types of companies. We have an operator, which is the company that owns a concession, and we have another company called a service company. That service company, deliver services for the operator, okay? And the same thing in Egypt or in everywhere, okay? But when it comes to hydraulic fracturing, in the United States, the operator has the logs, do the design for the hydraulic fracture, design everything, and call the service company just to pump that treatment. So the service company is only a pumping company. But in Egypt, for example, the service company, not the operator, will do the, the design. So you will call Halliburton and you will ask Halliburton or Schlumberger or Baker to design the frag job itself. So they will put the design, then they will come to the location and pump the treatment. But in the United States, who do the design is the operator the owner of the, of the location, not the service company. So which is a little bit uh, different. But this information from somewhere in the Middle East and uh, the job done by Halliburton. 
Okay, so Halliburton did the fracture design and they, they did also the pumping. Okay, so we have some information about the tubing inside the well. Here is the tubing, here is the casing. We have, you know, uh, about the, let's say, the um, uh, types and size and this kind of things. And also we have information about the perforation. This is very important. Perforation is very, very important in hydraulic fracturing. I need to have many shots per foot as possible. We prefer to have six shots per foot, but here in this case, we have only five. Although they say the face angle is 60. I don't know, you know, uh, I don't know uh, how. I mean, uh, 60 face degree means six shots per foot, not five. But anyway, it seems like a mistake. So we need to have many shots per foot as possible, five or six. And uh, why we we want to we want to have more shots and wider opening for for these holes because we want to uh, minimize the friction and we want to let the frac fluid goes easily to the formation. If the, this perf hole is very small or very little, you will lose a lot of friction, especially to penetrate this perforation and it gets the right direction to grow with perpendicular to the minimum, perpendicular to the minimum, and you will get a friction called a tortuosity. Okay, so you will lose a lot of friction. So you need to have many uh, shots per foot, uh, preferred six, not five, and the phase will be 60. Okay, and here is some information about the formation itself. And it is, again, you know, here's a poor, the uh, poor pressure, the permeability, and uh, the fat gradient and closure. Okay. So also we will do, we will build a mechanical S model. And the mechanical S model, as a result, we will show some logs plus some mechanical properties. So you need to show a plot for youngest models, a plot for Poisson's ratio, plot for UCS, plot for, let's say, minimum horizontal stress. And you, you show exactly where is the reservoir. Maybe you show the lithology to show that if it is a sandstone formation of how much sand, how much limestone, how much dolomite, how much shale, and so on. So uh, it is common to see something like this, plus a table, including the uh, mechanical properties that I will use later to feed the software, the simulator. Okay, here is what Halliburton uh, equipment, what Halliburton asked, you know, mentioned that th this is the minimum equipment they, they need. So frac tanks, they need five to six tanks, minimum and maximum. And one tank is 500 barrel. Most likely one tank is 500 barrel. And remember there's a dead volume at the bottom because the hose not getting from the bottom gets like a little bit higher. So we have a dead volume. Uh, try to think about these things when you walk in the field, okay? Here is a blender. We need one blender. The high pumps, we need to five, five to six. Sometimes we need to have one extra pump as a backup. Sometimes maybe one pump will not work, so it is better to have, um, you know, um, a backup one. Also, we need to have one manifold, and we need to have one TCC, which is the control of the monitoring unit, and we need to have one mountain mover. This is an equipment we use to move the propellant to the blender, okay? So in the blender, we'll mix the fluid with opened with chemicals and we will send it to the manifold. The manifold has two lines, low pressure goes to the pumps, then the pumps will return it back as a high pressure goes to the high pressure side of the manifold, then that high pressure side goes to the uh, wheel head. Okay, then inject it. Okay, also Halliburton or any other company, okay, will deliver you something that we call equipment lay layout. We need to put this equipment in order in the location because if the company man working for that company is not uh, experienced enough, for example, and he need to check everything, 
So he, this is the right setup. And he need later, when if he sees something not matching with the setup, he need to talk to the service company. Because maybe there is another service company, let's say a coil tubing company or a company that will provide a descender or whatever. They need to um, rig up in the location also. And you, need, you know, we need to know where is the space you will put the, you know, frack equipment, where is the space you will put the other, uh, you know, equipment. So we need to have every, all companies, you need to follow the, uh, the layout provided in the design. Okay. Okay, so here is one, two, three, four, five pumps. And here we call it Grizzly, Grizzly pump. This is by, uh, you know, uh, it is uh, a famous, you know, pump uh, work in Halliburton locations. It is two, 2,000 uh, horsepower. Okay. And here is a Panzer pump. This is a diff. It is a pump, but with a different specs. And in a different jobs, you you may see different types of pumps. But Grizzly, this is very, very uh, famous ones. And uh, Panzer, I believe, it is uh, more advanced one. Or, you know, uh, so a Grizzly is older, and Panzer is uh, recent one, new ones. Okay. And here is. The blender, here is the tanks, here is the mountain mover, here is a monitoring truck. And see the monitoring truck, it is better to see all the location or to see the wellhead and see the pumps. Mainly the wellhead should be visible from the monitoring truck. Okay. Okay, here is uh, for the fluid design, we will use uh, KCL 4%. Sometimes you see 4%, some other times you see 7%. It is different based on you know um, uh, the uh, amount of clays inside the formation, and also based on the designer. Okay, here is the name of the fluid. Here is the cross linker, the cross linker type. Here is the accelerator type. Here is um, you know fluid temperature degree because we will do some testing to test these fluids in the um, small location inside the monitoring truck. And we have a guy called the fluid tech, fluid technician, and he will do the test, the testing, showing the company man and all the representative of your, you know, the operator, that everything uh, is, uh, you know, following the uh, program. Okay. Here is a many frac pumping schedule. Okay. So here is by gallons, and I have six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And again, this is not this is not a Quran or a Bible. You know, just you know, this is a, just a design. Okay, and this is by gallon. Defect is a test. We similar to mini frac. You may do a mini frac. You may do defect and mini frac. Okay, and in the defect, I mean, I used uh, just water with for uh, KCL and. In many frac, I used linear gel. Okay, and here is the amounts, here is the rates, and here is how many minutes. Okay, and at the bottom there is some summary of the amounts injected. Here is the min frac pumping uh, schedule, which is very very important to all of you. We started from seven because when we did the mini frac, we stopped at six. It's just a number, not something important. And here, here is the clean volume. Here is a dirty volume. I believe there was a mistake here in the dirty volume. But anyway, the dirty volume, this is a volume when we mix with propent. Uh, uh, when you mix the fluid, the frac fluid with a propent. It cannot be the same number. Why? Because we should have a pad volume at the beginning. So the clean volume must be like, uh, larger. Okay. So I believe there is, uh, no, 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 it is not a mistake. They fixed that here later. My apologize. Okay, so here is the rate. 25, when we start the injection, 20, this is a pad volume. This is a pad, 25 barrel per minute. And here is 
a propent, it means this is not a pad anymore. A pad is a, a stage when we inject a frac fluid without any propent, without any propent. So here, whenever you see propent showing up, it means we stop, we already done with a pad. Okay, and here you see two numbers, one by gallons and uh, one by red, this is by barrel. Okay, so here is a stage and this is one PPG, two PPG, three PPG. So I'm increasing the propent concentration gradually. I cannot start from a high propent concentration. If you will do this, you will get tip screen out immediately and you cannot continue the job. And for sure, you may get, uh, here in United States, you may get fired. Okay, because this is considered a uh, very poor design. Okay. Okay, until it reached six pounds per gallon, then the dead flush. Flush is all the well bore now filled with propent, right? I'm injecting frac fluid mixed with propent. So whenever you finish, you need to flush all the propane inside the well bore to the formation. Okay, and remember to, to do it under flush, not over flush. If you keep pushing the propane deep inside the formation, and when you stop pumping, the, the part that facing the well bore will not have uh, will not has any propane. So when it closes, there is no communication. So you did a frack. And you lost the communication with that frag between the frag and the wool bore. So this is again very poor design. So when you flush, be sure that you under flush. You keep four or five barrels of propane in the wool bore. Why? Later I will clean them. But this is way better than over flush and push all the propane deep inside the formation and the part uh, you know uh, from the formation facing the wool bore will not have any. Uh, will not have any uh, propent, and when it closes, there is no communication. There is no uh, high uh, conductivity because there is no there is no propent. So keep this in your mind. Do under flush, not over flush. And here is the type of um, uh, again the type of uh, fluid and volumes, and at the bottom there is a summary. Okay. Here is the output of the frac pro. And here is the fracture, how it looks like. Here is the perforation, and here is the fracture width, and here is the fracture length. This is a good, a good fracture design. And in this table, you see this is a fracture length, probe length, total fracture height, total propon height, and you see these numbers. There's probe length less than the fracture length. It means not all the propon reach all the end to the of the fracture. So the fracture length will be longer than the probed lens. The probed lens, this is the fracture, the lens of the, what is the propent uh, can reach and, you know, and, and continuous, you know. Uh, so it would be less than the fracture lens. Okay. Here is my last slide for today. Here is the G function. Look, I can see <coughs> this upper hump here. <coughs> Sorry for that. <coughs> okay, so I can see the uh, J function. Anyone remember what that mean? Which one has upper hump? And here I cannot consider that a straight line. Okay. Is it PDL or something else? If you consider this as a little bit of straight line, we can consider it PDL. Otherwise, I can consider it what? Which one is this? Fracture tip extension, but this will happen if the permeability is very low. So check the permeability. If the permeability is very low, so maybe it is a, a tip extension. If not, maybe it is PDL. 
if you know that this formation has, you know, more many natural fractures, so maybe it is PDL. So now you are suspecting too, maybe it is a PDL or a tip extension, okay? Okay, let's, uh, here is a questions I asked you before, and I will try to ask you again. Try to answer the questions again, and I will see if you can get them right or not. Okay. So this is not very nice. I was expecting you will get all of them perfect. You're still confused. Okay, so let me end the poll and share the results with you. And now I will start answering this question. So uh, hydraulic fraction is what kind of failure I mentioned is a tension failure. Keep this in your mind. Hydraulic fracturing is a tension failure because you are applying force from inside the, the well bore. And this is when this force increase, it would be tension failure, okay? So uh, the second question, the J function helps to estimate the closure pressure Yes, the J function helps to estimate the closure pressure. Yes. The third question, the J function helps to understand leak off behavior. Yes. Okay, the four types of the leak off, I got them because uh, I'm doing the J function, then I will see how it will look like. Then I can get, uh, understand the behavior of the leak off. The last question, the manifrac test is not important to do before any hydraulic frac job, true or false. Guys, this is a confusing question. You can say yes and you can say no. You can say true and you can say false. I told you that I'm advising all of you to do manifrac test. If you are doing a frac for a fracking for uh, sandstone formation, for example, you can, uh, you should do it. It is not expensive, it is, it is not very expensive. Okay, and you already have the, the material in the location, okay? But I have seen that in many companies, if you frack many, many neighbor wells and the engineer has a feeling, have the feeling that they understand all the properties of that reservoir. There is no need to spend more time or more money to understand that uh, reservoir because they have many neighbor wells and we already did many frac tests for all of them before fracking and now they they don't need to collect any more information because they believe they already have what they need so sometimes they ignore or they neglect doing a mini frac test but uh, again if it is your choice do a mini frac test and defend try to understand the formation before you frack it try to um, uh, you know, uh, um, try to uh, update your design parameters to be sure that, you know, all of them uh, correct or at least has the minimum uncertainty. So the frag dimension you will design, uh, the output from your software will be very close to the real one. For sure, you, want, you cannot get it exactly the same dimension, but if you get it like 20%, uh, you know, uh, different or you know 80 percent matching with the software this is a very good design okay okay so i will stop sharing the result and i should thank you very much for attending this lecture and now i will be happy to answer your question if you have any we would like to express our deepest gratitude to you dr ahmed as usual the session was very informative but uh, we actually have some questions. Sure, go ahead. So the first question is, um, someone is asking whether, uh, what is the DFIT test? And what's the difference between uh, DFIT and mini frac? And which one is better? 
Okay, so uh, this is exactly a very good question. You know, I cannot expect, this is not a student question. This is a student, this is a question of uh, someone uh, most likely working back and will know exactly what he's talking about. So defect or diagnostic fracture injection test. And many frac is, you know, a, a, a test we do for, um, uh, you know, before the frac job. Most likely they have similarity. The output is uh, similar, but uh, still there is some differences. So there is some, in some cases, uh, we recommend to do DFET and Minifrac at the same time. In some cases we, uh, we say, hey, maybe the, the Minifrac will be enough. And uh, in the last lecture, I believe one of the things that I wanna do is I will get a slide comparing when we should do DFET and when we should do um, uh, a mini frac. But again, the objective is almost the same. Both of them we use to understand the closure pressure, the minimum horizontal stress or the breakdown pressure, the leak off. But we, um, in some situation, we recommend doing the FET. In other you know, situations, we recommend doing mini frac. So I will get you uh, this answer as a part of next lecture. So I wish, you know, just uh, wait for uh, seven days and I will get you something very, very uh, clear and something written for that. But again, this is a very good question. Um, the second question is, uh, why are they making a difference between uh, hydraulic fracturing and unconventional hydraulic fracturing? Uh, what is the aim of unconventional hydraulic fracturing? Okay, so uh, again, this is a very good question. You know, here in the United States and also in China and Argentina, there is a high uh, activity of um, uh, producing oil and gas from uh, out of shale. But shale is, looks very different from the conventional reservoir. When we say conventional reservoir, mo most likely we, we talk about sandstone formation, uh, limestone formation, dolomite formation, these things we call it conventional, conventional reservoir. But shale uh, is unconventional. It is not only, it is not the only one, the, the, you know, also the tight sand is unconventional, you know, cold bed sand is unconventional. But for the shale, the permeability is extremely low. We count the permeability by nanodust. Nan nanodust is like a part of, you know, like 10 to power of minus nine. Uh, so it is something very, very, very small, okay? So if you wanna do, for example, um, a well testing, if you wanna do a mini frac test, for example, or DFET or whatever, it means because of the extremely low permeability, if you wanna watch the pressure, how the pressure decline, you need to stay for uh, four months. Who will close a well for four months to watch the pressure declining? So it is not practical to do um, uh, a mini frac test, for example, for uh, shale formation. Why it is not practical? Because the period of time you need to monitor or watch the pressure declining, so you will do your analysis, will take very, very long time, maybe months, maybe years. Maybe you need to watch uh, a formation for one or two years. Is it practical? No. So, uh, also, from its name, when we say unconventional reservoir, you see everything unconventional. We cannot produce any oil and gas from shale, for example, without doing three things. Without doing drilling horizontal wells, without doing hydraulic fracturing, or without using slip water. So these three things, you need to do them to produce in an economic way from a shale play. But why I'm not focusing here in, uh, about this? Because most of my audience or the students attending this class, not from the United States. So we are focusing mainly on the unconventional, something you can see in Saudi and Emirates and Egypt and Algeria. This is why we are focusing on sandstone formation and the limestone and dolomite formations. I wish this uh, answered your question. Um, the third question is that uh, frag dimension in term of width and height, uh, what should be the contact area to the well bore looks like? Um, and is casing perforated port 
supports and cement sustain its shape or have the same frac uh, geometry. And basically, he's asking for the sake of erosion calculation, especially if we have screen. And he's looking at the velocity calculation. Okay, so this is three questions. Can you ask them one by one and answer them one by one? Because I'm, I'm not uh, having a good memory to memorize. So what is the first one? The first one is a uh, frag dimension in terms of foot and height. What should be the contact area to the wellbore looks like? Okay, so whenever we say a contact area, I'm talking about all the fracture area, just in case of this fracture is connected in a good way with the wellbore. Okay, because for example, when I mentioned about over flushing, you can create a very big fracture area, but if you do over flushing, this fracture area will not be connected to the wood board. So you end up with wasting your money and time. Okay, so I, I can calculate the fracture area if I'm assuming it is two sides, assuming this is the ideal, you know, uh, theory about uh, fracking the sandstone formation, for example, and I can assume that area. And if it is connected to the, to the well bore, we can use that in estimating the, the, the productivity, in estimating how much also we need to add to that, the, the other reservoir uh, parameters, the um, reservoir pressure, the um, uh, permeability, the, you know, all of these things. Okay, so uh, the fracture height, we assume uh, just an, as an assumption that the fracture height is only the height of the reservoir. But when you, when you do the job, even when you do uh, uh, the simulation, the fracture height maybe grow uh, upward. Sometimes it grow you know, uh, downward a little bit, but most of the cases, the upward grow will be way higher because when you grow upward, it will go to less stress because when you go upward, it is less stress. So the fracture will tend to go to the least resistance, which is the upward direction. So most of the case you may get, if the, your reservoir thickness is, let's say 50 feet thickness, and you do a hydraulic frac job, you may get a fracture height of um, 200 feet. Why we get that? Because there is no good barrier at the top. And again, this is different from a, a reservoir to another reservoir. So how to simulate that and how to estimate the, the fracture height in a good way, if you have good understanding to the mechanical properties, you can get that with minimum uncertainty. Again, there is nothing perfect. We are trying to minimize the uncertainty. For sure, the, the fracture we design in, in our software is not the same fracture we will get in real life, but if they are 70% similar, this is okay. Okay, for the fracture width, again, it is based on the understanding the mechanical properties and the, the, the frac fluid we are injecting because it is also has uh, properties that affect the width and also the propane we are injecting, it is also affect the width. So all of these things, the simulator will use all of this data regarding the mechanical properties, the fluid, the propane, and will give you a good estimate for the fracture width. And we are estimating something like, um, let's say, uh, two millimeters, something like that, fracture width. Okay, this is the first one. What is the second one? The second question. Um, yeah, is uh, casing perforated ports in uh, cement basically sustain its shape or like they have the same frac geometry or not? Okay, w when we perforate, so we, we drill the well, I mean the section that, you know, penetrates the reservoir. Let's say I'm talking about the bottom reservoir and we have something like we call the rat hole, maybe one or, one or 200 feet extra at the bottom reservoir. And we set a casing and we put the cement, okay? Now we need to perforate because after the casing and semen, there is no communication between the reservoir and the wool bore, and we need to make, create these holes. And you can do perforation either by wire line or TCP or using you know, something like a pipe, uh, a tube and conveyed uh, perforation. 
And for fracking, we prefer to have six shots per, uh, per foot. So every one foot has six shots as a spiral. So it is not a circle, it is a spiral. If you look to our perforation gun, you will see the shots in a spiral uh, shape. And every one foot has a specific number of shots. And these shots should have a width because it has, um, let's say, a TNT or you know, whatever the explosive. There's different types of explosives. And every type can give you, let's say, a specific penetration, like the, you know, how deep inside the formation and how big is this uh, uh, holes. And we need to get something big as possible and uh, five or six per, 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 foot, per, per, uh, foot, per foot, this is a good number for, uh, for fracking. Why we do it this way? It mainly uh, to minimize the friction, especially the tortuosity, because the hydraulic fraction will grow in a direction perpendicular to the minimum horizontal stress. And in most cases, I don't know what is the direction of the minimum horizontal stress. So to, uh, to minimize the, uh, the friction, I do it this way. I do it six shots per foot and use uh, shots can give me bigger holes to minimize the friction, okay? So this is what we do it. And most likely we perforate and frack, you know, back to back. We, we you know, we, uh, we do the perforation and we frack after that. This is very common practice, especially let's say in the Western desert in Egypt. Um, most of the wells, we, uh, perforate, we drill it, perforate it, frack it. Okay, what is that third one? Um, this is an, another question. Uh, when uh, do exactly the closure uh, pressure uh, basically is located in the G function derivative? You know what, again, you... you um, uh, when we plotted the J function, we get a straight line from the origin and we see when it will touch, if there's a hump upward or a, that hump, if it has a, a straight line after it or not, or if that hump is downward or if it, it is no hump or no, or no curve and it is a straight line, okay? But how to do it as an expert, I should know an estimate for a closure pressure. What is roughly should be the value? So if I do a J function analysis, for example, and I'm at my and the minimum horizontal stress was let's say eight thousand psi, and you get me a closure pressure of uh, two thousand psi because you did G function analysis, for sure there's something wrong. So I should know that the closure pressure should not less than the minimum horizontal stress by too much. It should be closer close to the minimum horizontal stress. So I, I know that it maybe it should be something like 6,000 psi, for example, or 7,000, for, for example, okay? So this will help me to put my straight line the right way and know exactly, hey, this point, most likely this is the closure pressure. And again, it is, uh, it is not a perfect job. We are trying to, um, uh, to get as much as possible something makes sense. So maybe I will do the analysis and I will get the closure pressure of 7,000 PSI. And another expert did the analysis and I get the closure pressure of 6,800. So there is 200 PSI difference. This is not a big problem. Who's right and who's wrong? Most likely both of us right. Try to get uh, numbers that close to the right numbers or what we believe it is right. But again, this, the analysis and design, this is like, a, you know, a lot of debate about it. And there is different techniques to calculate it. So maybe you will use a technique, uh, let's say, J um, function technique, and you get the closure pressure of 5,000, and you use a uh, square root of time technique, and you get it uh, 4,900. So there's 100 PSI difference. Which one is right, which one is wrong? I can get an average, not a problem. I can mention both. I can say, I state, hey, I, I believe that J function will be better, no problem. But remember that the two numbers will not have a big difference. Okay? Okay, what else? Um, in the example shown earlier, there is a chance in the prop and size 
in the last stages? Why do you want to achieve with that? Okay, so we're changing the propane size. Why we are not using a one size propane? Is it correct? Is it, am I getting the question right? So Salma, um, can you repeat the question again? Just I want to be sure that I'm answering the, the right question. Yeah, he said that in the example shown, there is a chance in the propane size in the last stages. You mean it in the last stages. There's a change. There's a change. I, yes. He, Maybe he wrote yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. there is a change in the propane okay. size. So sometimes we use different types of propane. So maybe you will see we use very small propane at the beginning. Okay? Because this will minimize the chance that that, that very small propane will go deeper inside the formation and will minimize the chance of having tip screen out. If I know that 90% of my job is okay, or 80% of my job is okay, so I'm not worried anymore of getting early screen out. I may inject bigger propent if this match with the fracture width. Remember again, the propent size must be matched with uh, uh, your understanding to, uh, uh, of the mechanical properties. If you inject a bigger bowl and the cannot it is bigger than the, the fracture width, it will not enter. Okay, but you can use different sizes of propane to get a better um, conductivity, to minimize the chance of getting screen out and at the same time to get better conductivity and get better, better production. And again, this is a part of your uh, design and you know, a lot of research about, you know, done about that, but yes, we do it this way. But remember, the smaller propane will be leading, will be at the beginning. And later, I can use a bigger uh, problem if both of them okay with the fracture widths or less than the fracture uh, widths. The yeah. next question is, um, is the Horner method a right method to determine the right closure pressure value? Okay, so um, uh, the, the, the problem is the injection time in fracking is not that much. Is as like we, we inject, let's say, for uh, 50 minutes, 60 minutes. So the techniques we, we uh, the analysis we do, let's say, like a uh, Horner method or like that, you know, what we do in the, let's say, in the follow up uh, testing, it, the concept is very similar, but sometimes, but in our case, we use something also we, we, what we call the impulse, impulse method. But we have uh, many methods tailored for hydraulic fracturing analysis. So if you have an injector and you want to analyze that uh, injectivity, okay, we have many well tests to do that, but in hydraulic fracturing, we have some tailored, which is very similar, but we have some, some tailored techniques like uh, Nolte and uh, Solomon and Craig. Okay, if you are interested to, to know more about these techniques, I can get you, I can share some slides with you about them. So we can say it is very similar, but not identical. What well, we can get, we can get the permeability and, and, and initial reservoir pressure, which is very similar again to what we do in, in, in normal well testing. The next question is, uh, what's the difference between tight reservoir stimulation and shale stimulation? Okay, so, uh, Tight reservoir, maybe he or she mean tight sand. Okay, so tight, if, if, if we are talking about tight sand, so sa tight sand is a sandstone formation, but it is again, it is very, very tight. So the formation, uh, permeability, measured by nano Darcy again. So the permeability very similar to the range of the permeability of uh, shale, but the chemical composition of the formation itself is different. The tight sand formation, mainly um, uh, sandstone, but for shale formation, for the shale, at least we have something like 40 or 45% shale. And the other percentages is some limestone, some dolomite, some uh, quartz and other stuff, but we, at least we have 40, 45, or maybe 50% shale. And remember again, whenever we say shale formation, it doesn't mean it is 100% shale, no. Shale formation means 
maybe you know something like uh, more than 40, 40 or 45 percent shade. Maybe more than that, but you know at least it should have that value. For the tight sand, the major portion uh, is sandstone, but the permeability are very similar. Both of them, uh, the permeability by Nano Darcy, and both of them. Awesome. When I say both of them, I'm talking about sand, uh, tight sand, and shade. Both of them, I cannot develop them without uh, horizontal well drilling. I cannot develop them without hydraulic fraction, massive hydraulic fraction, or multi-stage uh, hydraulic fraction. So they are similar, but they are not identical, mainly because the chemical composition is different. Okay, what else? Well, uh, can we use machine learning techniques to predict uh, failure behavior and closure Before you pressure? say anything, uh, you, you can use um, uh, machine learning in anything. But can you complete the question again? <laughs> So he's asking if we can use the machine learning technique to predict the failure behavior and closure pressure from the previous wells. Okay, so um, it is common practice to use machine learning in knowing, uh, ordering the wells that it is better to frack earlier. So this is something we, it is common and we, we used to do that. Because let's say if you are planning to frack 500 wells in one year, okay? Maybe uh, not all of them will give you the same result. Let's say if well will give you more production, try to frack it uh, first, right? If well will produce less, uh, try to um, um, keep it to the end, for example. So machine learning may help us doing something like that. So before, again, machine learning, we can use it in anything, but we need to have a clear objective. What is exactly you want to do? You want to predict the closure pressure? Okay, but you need first to collect some information. Maybe the problem is not that complex to use a machine learning. You can use a machine learning, but I believe this is uh, an easy problem for machine learning. We can get it by experience. If you tell me that there's five neighbor wells and it is the same formation, and this well, the, the, the closure pressure was uh, 7,000, and the second one was um, uh, 7,100, and this one was seven, you know, 7,050, and this one was 6,900. So if you collect this data, you will notice that maybe all of them are changing in 200, 300 PSI if there is not a big geologic difference. They are very close. There is, the depth is very similar. There is, you know, there is a lot of big similarity between, between them. It is the same formation and they are very close to each other. Maybe this is a very simple problem for machine learning. But uh, the answer is yes, you can use machine learning if you want. The next question is, um, can the propent used in uh, fracturing have a negative effect on the mobility of hydrocarbons after fracturing? Yes, but this is only if you hire, uh, let's say, uh, someone know nothing about well stimulation or know nothing about uh, fracking, and you ask him to design a job. Let's say, if your dad work as a, um, let's say, uh, physician or um, a teacher in elementary school, for example, or let's say, you know, uh, whatever job not related to oil and gas, and you ask him to design a frack job for you, for sure he will uh, make a disaster. So, um, let's say, if you forget to add breaker, what will happen? If you forget to do a frag job without adding breaker, which is a chemical we use to break down the, that viscous fluid and make it linear gel again. So we can get it as a, uh, we can get this frag fluid back to the, to the well bore during the flow back period. If you forget to add a breaker, what will happen? You will produce zero, okay? If you, uh, if you use a propent has a, a strength uh, less than the stresses inside the formation. So this propent will get crushed. What will happen 
if there is that popcorn get crushed, you will lose the conductivity. You will keep losing. Maybe you will not produce zero, but for sure you will keep losing, losing the productivity because you use the wrong propane. Okay. So um, uh, if you let's say if you get a frac fluid and you um, that frac fluid that did not meet the, um, the specifications has a lot of iron, for example, and you decided to inject it because you did not know that the iron and phosphate and other solids must be less than a specific amount. And you did not do a testing for that. So if you do a poor job, if you are not a good company man, if you are not a good frac engineer, if you are not good, you know, uh, frac supervisor, yes, you can make a disaster. What else? Um, the next question is, um, are we supposed to only use the closure uh, phenomena or is there any other thing that we can use in hydraulic fracturing process? Okay, the closure pressure. I need to know the closure pressure to separate between when I should use the analysis technique for pre-closure and after closure. We agree that we have two groups of well testing analysis for, to evaluate frag, a frag job. Some of them, we do it before closure and the other group, we do it after closure. But if you don't know when is the closure, how you will decide what is the right technique? No way, right? So we have two groups of analysis. Some of them, one group after, we call it after closure analysis or pre-closure analysis. And another group or, or techniques, we call it after closure analysis. And what is after closure, I get the permeability and initial reservoir pressure. What is before closure, I get the, uh, let's say the leak off, for example. Okay, but the, what is very important is to know exactly what is the closure pressure. And to get the closure pressure, I can get the, I can use the, the J function technique or I can use the square root of time technique. This is what is very, very common. So I must know what is the closure, or I must know what is the, the an est, a good estimate for closure to know exactly what is the, the portion of pressure decline I need to pick to do my analysis. Otherwise, I cannot do an analysis. What else? Um, how many meters will the uh, frac be in the reservoir? Okay, this is one of the very funny things when we ask about how many meters. You know, most of the countries in oil and gas, we are using feet. Okay, so some experts, when you ask them, let's say, how many cubic meters is the volume? I get confused because all the time he used to use how many barrels. Okay, so... How many meters? I can tell you a good average is, uh, let's say, 400 feet. 400 feet, we're well, talking about, let's say, 120 meters, something like that. This is a good average. If you tell me it is not 400 feet, it becomes 500 feet, not a problem. But if you tell me it is 5,000 feet, no, there is something wrong. I'm comparing 5,000 feet with the volume I'm injecting with the rate, and I know this is impossible. Why? Because I, 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 ran, uh, I ran many, many jobs before, and I know this is, doesn't make any sense. Okay, so a good, uh, back to the question, uh, a good estimate for a frac uh, half lens, maybe uh, something between 100 to 150 uh, meter. Okay, but again, this is not, it is different. Uh, maybe a better answer is to, hey, talk to me about a specific reservoir and a specific design and a specific case, and I can give you an estimate. But we cannot generalize a, you know, answer like this. The last question is, um, can you recommend any book that will help us to understand hydraulic fracturing more? Okay, there is many books by uh, Michael Economides. But the most famous book in hydraulic fracturing, there is a book, there is a big 
book called uh, Reservoir Stimulation. Okay, and this book uh, is like a, a big manual of hydraulic fracturing, acidizing, and acid fracturing. And, uh, you know, uh, you can buy a PDF. Also, there is the book of uh, production systems by Michael Economides. It has uh, many, maybe three or four chapters about uh, hydraulic fracturing. So the easy way, just go to Amazon or Google and write, let's say, Michael Economides books. You'll, you'll find many of them talking about hydraulic fracturing because there are many books in the market. Okay. And that's it up for today. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, and thank you all. Uh, the lecture will be uploaded to Pi Petro YouTube channel. Don't forget to solve the quiz on Google Classroom. So thank you again and see you next Saturday. Okay, thank you very much. Have a wonderful rest of the day.